Come with us on a journey, a journey to a place where information is unlocked, knowledge is gained, and the exchange of experiences welcome. This is the Knowledge Exchange, presented by Lakeland Community College. Welcome back, everybody, or maybe for some of you, this is the first time you're seeing this encore presentation of um, the coronavirus um, global pandemic. Um, what was our official title? I don't even remember now. Something like a you know a global mistake uh, theme. Um, we got three presenters. I'm one of them. I'll be kind of uh, doing the, the final leg of the discussion. We've got Mike Kortenenko, our resident virologist here at the college, will be speaking uh, lion's share of the presentation talking about the biology of the vaccine uh excuse me of the uh, virus and then we've got uh jd who will be speaking more about the testing side of the story and i'm going to wrap it up talking a little bit more about a broader uh, umbrella problem that kind of led us to this to this day um and these issues so mike we're going to have you start we'll need to switch screens uh, to get things going. And, oh, a couple of things in terms of logistics. Uh, for those who have questions along the way, feel free to use the chat function. You should see that button in the lower right-hand side of the of the app. Um, just post your questions. We will try to address them as they come in as best we can. And Phil will be helping out with that. Uh, additionally, expect this to go about 90 minutes. That's the aim here. Probably the first 50 minutes or so will be Mike's time, another 15, 20 for JD, and I'll wrap up with the last 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then if there are any questions afterwards, we'll be able to address those as well. Okay, Mike, you're ready to go? All right, floor is yours. All right, everybody, thanks for uh, virtual attending. Um, we're going to start. I'm going to um, hope everybody can see this um, story, these illustrations that I'm using. And I'm going to start with an explanation, general explanation, what the virus or a virus actually is. Um, viruses are non-living. That's important to understand. They do not consist of cells. So that means that they need a living host to, well, say, reproduce. Specifically, viruses have to infect cells. There are many viruses in nature. We actually don't know how many. The estimates put it at millions. And only small proportion of those uh, is known to infect humans. Again, you know, there are things that we know we know. There are things we know we don't know. And there are certain things that we don't know, but we don't know that we don't know them. So um, structurally, what a virus is like. Viruses can be naked, like this one. Um, adenovirus, it's going to be kind of a player uh, further in the discussion. Naked virus has its genetic information right here in the center. I circle it. This genetic information is neatly packaged into what we call capsid. And viruses can be enveloped, like this HIV or our main character of the story, coronavirus. It means that they are like your, you know, something that you order from Amazon. The most valuable thing, the genome, the genome here, packaged in a capsid and in the envelope from the outside. That's your earphones in the box in the Amazon packaging. Now, the fact that um, coronavirus is enveloped virus uh, will be quite important in our further discussions of virus survival on, well, survival is not really a good word to describe the behavior of non-living organisms, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Uh, virus survival on the surfaces. Now, um, that image here, image of the coronavirus that you can see on the PowerPoint, at least I hope you can see PowerPoint. Um, those little purple things are spike proteins. Virus uses them to get into the cell and they are really uh, one of the main targets for 
uh, various therapeutics and prophylactic, um, you know, mitigation efforts like vaccines. Now, uh, coronavirus is nothing. Cor coronaviruses is nothing new to humanity. There are four uh, circulating seasonal human coronaviruses with names that are rolling off the tongue, like OC43. And they cause, as I mentioned, they cause um, common cold illnesses. So on the uh, very confusing graph on the right, um, it shows uh, when these viruses most frequently cause illness. And you can see that it's, you know, like winter, 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 winter. So it's, you know, normal seasonal cold doesn't really um, do anything terrible except for stuffy nose and fever and cough, okay? Now, uh, although those viruses are normally circulating through the human population, there were two major outbreaks of what we call zoonotic coronaviruses, coronaviruses that jumped into humans from animals. Now, I want to, you know, kind of mention that um, the movement of infectious agents uh, from animals to humans is nothing new. If we start listing, we will never stop. Things that come to mind include rabies, uh, West Nile virus, yellow fever, um, bubonic plague. All of these are examples of zoonotic viruses or bacterial infections that jump into humans from animals. Now, first one, SARS-CoV-1, coronavirus regional SARS, jumped into humans from mm, most likely civets, small cat-like species of uh, carnivores in 2002 to 2003. Uh, it was kind of a big deal at the time. Um, case fatality ratio to rate was 9.6%, which meant that roughly one out of 10 people who were diagnosed, and I want to highlight it, diagnosed, actually died. And then there was an outbreak, really outbreak of uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus, MERS, which was first recorded in 2012, and it kind of is smoldering in uh, Arabian Peninsula up until now. There were, um, as you can see, 2,500 roughly 2,500 cases and uh, 855, 858 deaths. So it is pretty It is pretty lethal. It's pretty bad, okay? Now, why these viruses did not move um, throughout the human population with the same success as the current one? Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about symptoms, but those viruses, they, they, their replication in humans generally corresponded with the diseases. So people who got sick were promptly isolated. And as you can imagine, when hospital personnel takes all the necessary precautions, um, transmission uh, of a virus from person to person can be largely mitigated. So what about this virus? Well, as you all know, right now, first cases uh, were confirmed in China in 2019, and up until now, this SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, has not been identified in any animals, but, you know, kind of stupid statement, but it's impossible to test all animals in a geographical region such as China, so you don't really know Notwithstanding, you cannot really test all bats or something like that. Um, so, um, ba -ba -bum. yeah. So, most likely, this virus originated in bats because there are multiple SARS related coronaviruses in bats, some with a very high degree of similarity. And two hypotheses right now that um, are generated about the origin of this virus. So virus was selected in animals, 
then it jumped into humans and that's it it was successful enough to spread through human population like you know wildfire um in wildfires in california or colorado um another hypothesis is that the virus sometime in the past jumped from animals to humans and then underwent selection in humans adapted to become more transmissible in humans this is a valid hypothesis however first one that uh, it was kind of you know a perfect storm that originated in animals uh, is more widely accepted um, now as a scientist i will never say you know no categorically no but all evidence that we have now and it's overwhelming evidence shows that virus has a natural origin this conspiracy theory is that virus was manipulated by humans and was created in the lab all i can say is the person who worked in virology field for um, like eight years no more than that, more than that 11 years uh, i wish i wish it would be possible to create a virus uh, we just don't have that level of knowledge that level of uh, sophistication that level of understanding of you know virus viruses and how they work and what um how changes in their genome alter their function we just don't have that knowledge we just can't do that just simply just no okay it's not possible um there were some implications of pangolins as um, a regional reservoir for the virus, we, we just don't know. As Dr. Anthony Fauci recently stated, we are in no data zone in many aspects of this, of this pandemic. Um, transmission could have occurred in the wet market. I found some um, common, um, you know, what's that? Wikipedia licensed, basically, free pictures here of the wet markets in China and you can see that in this um, very crowded conditions let's say uh, transmission between animals from animals to humans is a no-brainer okay another reasonable possibility is that uh, this virus actually jumped from a wild animal um, into a farmer and then that farmer came in a, uh, in a wet market and transmission started just coincided that it was a wet market. What we kind of in a nutshell, yeah, it is a zoonotic virus. It came from animals. So that is a huge picture. I don't want to get too much into the details. I want to highlight certain key steps of the virus life cycle. So first key step, in order to infect the cell virus, has to attach to the receptor. That's number one. Then it gets into the cell, goes like uncoating, releases its um, genetic information. And then another important step, virus has replicate its genome and it has to produce its proteins. And then when genome is replicated, there are multiple copies of the genome. And when viral proteins are produced in sufficient amounts, um, virus particles get packaged, released from the cell. Why I pay so much attention to the process of attachment, replication, and protein synthesis, especially replication and attachment. If we can target with drugs, um, or any other form of therapeutic, these two steps of virus life cycle, it is possible to reduce the disease burden on humans or prevent the infection or somehow kind of soften the infection. Um, so few words about transmission, there's been a lot and I hear a lot of flag towards epidemiologists saying that um, but six months ago or whatever it is you were telling us to bleach every grape that we buy in a grocery store but masks are not needed 
Well, as Dr. Fauci said, we are in no data zone. We learn. And scientists learned that main route of transmission is large respiratory droplets. We talk, we, th we sing any um, strenuous respiratory activity, uh, voluntary or involuntary, um, will generate large respiratory droplets. This is why physical distancing, this is why masks. I see a lot of pretty um, dumb posts saying, oh, how do masks work if virus is so stupendously small and it can easily go between the fibers of a cloth? We do not produce virus. We produce droplets that contain virus. And if we can uh, block droplets from you know, spreading away from our mouth, we can prevent virus from spreading away from our mouth. I hope it makes sense. Breathing, aerosol. Um, apparently, it contributes, but not as much. Okay. And fomites, um, fomites meaning inanimate objects, have minimal effect on transmission. So you can finally put that bottle of bleach away and start eating unwashed fruits and vegetables and, you know, have other problems other than the viral infections. Uh, virus can't stay active on surfaces. Uh, there was a famous publication in, I think it was in New England Journal of Medicine. I, I've got some illustrations from it here showing its stability on different um, surfaces. So a uh, few things to consider when you look at data like this. And they do compare SARS-CoV-2, which is red, to original SARS, which is blue. They kind of similar. SARS seems to kind of survive a little bit worse on cardboard. But other than that, if you look at Half-Life here, 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 or here, um, Half-Life is kind of, you know, similar. Um, anyway, my point is it really depends how much virus was on the surface in the first place. That's number one. It really depends on what conditions your surfaces were. So like if your um, cardboard box was sitting in the sun, like Amazon delivery dropped it off in front of your garage in the sun and it was sitting there for, I don't know, three, four hours in the sun. Yeah, that's probably not a lot. So that's kind of uh, my take on the survival on the surfaces. Also, another important thing, I mentioned that this is an enveloped virus. Enveloped viruses are weak. Uh, structurally, they do not survive in the environment very well. Um, they very easily get destroyed. Uh, there was a lot of conversations about transmission to kids, from kids, between kids. Um, it is. It was an exciting thing to watch how scientific knowledge develops. Initially, we thought that kids do not uh, get sick really easily and do not transmit very well. And later, uh, overpouring of data demonstrated that it's not true. Kids get, and by kids, I mean all the way up to high school seniors. Um, they can get infected fairly easily. They can spread it between themselves. They can transmit it to other people. Okay. It is true, though, that they have much milder symptoms. And that conversation kind of plays into all the discussion that we had in July and August about opening colleges and, and schools and universities. And if you would look at the latest data on colleges and schools and universities, you will see that um, turns out in school transmission, in class transmission, is minimal. It is true for virtually every educational setting from elementary to middle to high school to community colleges to four-year universities. Outbreaks that we saw on campuses across the country were associated with dorm parties. 
they were not associated with in-class transmissions. And I can I can share sort of anecdote. My kids attend um, boarding school, so dorms are involved, and their school implemented a very comprehensive plan, uh, which did not take into account football practice before start of the season. And they had a massive outbreak in the football team. A couple of dozen kids, something like that. I don't remember the exact numbers, but a bunch of kids got infected and they had very mild symptoms. They all successfully recovered and that was it. Um, school reported recently, just a couple of days ago, I've got an email that first boarding student got infected and it was not on campus, like not in the classroom. So um, they managed to maintain you know conducive environment conducive to education environment for a pretty long time I actually lost a bet to my wife because I told her that they're going to go back online in September and they didn't so um, why why everybody talks so much to almost the point of exhaustion about physical distancing and masks uh, in this panel uh, I think it's from CDC publication, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. I don't remember from uh, the top of my head. So it's odds ratio of getting the infection um, in different settings. So you can see that restaurants and bars and coffee shops, churches and gyms seem to be riskiest. Now, in restaurant, unfortunately, they do not break down indoor versus outdoor dining. But there were some kind of reports that outdoor <clears throat> seems to be um, much safer than indoor. Well, yeah. Um, bar, coffee shop, I mentioned last time we did that. I don't know why they... Um, kind of put these two categories together because behavior of people in bars and behavior of people in coffee shops, is significant. their behaviors are significantly different. Um, church, religious gathering, a lot of talking, a lot of singing, people are in close proximity. Um, virus seems to be transmitted very effectively in so-called super spreader events. So this is the publication from South Korea um, each cluster corresponds to a such super spreader event. Um, so this first, the massive cluster, uh, was called a bar and band cluster when a band was with some folks in the band being infected, traveled from one bar to another and kind of, you know, carried contagion with them. A uh, wedding was associated and religious gathering in a temple. Other than that, you see the transmission chains were pretty short, but let's not let's not forget this is North Korea. No, sorry, South Korea, I'm sorry. This is South Korea with extensive uh, contact tracing, mitigation efforts, um, very, um, how to say, great medical system with a lot of um, hospital beds so they could isolate even mildly symptomatic patients, so on and so forth. Um, another issue that uh, was often brought up in um, the conversations about the transmission is so-called D614G mutation that apparently increases the transmission. The main problem with the statements like that is that they don't have substantial amount of data backing those up. Uh, there is there are data showing that uh, this mutation, D614G, increases the ability of the virus to infect cells in the cell culture. So it's a very, very modal thing. Nobody, up for obvious reasons, cannot take this virus and compare it to sort of an original strain, original type, isolate, and compare how they behave in humans, would be inhumane. It is true that it kind of um, started to dominate, but um, Steve, I think, can back me up on that. Uh, it's very well known effect in evolution. 
the bottleneck effect or the founder's effect. If this virus ends up in a certain population and another one doesn't, then it's going to spread through the population without any uh, competition. So, so far, a jury is still out on whether or not that mutation changes the ability of virus to get transmitted between people. Now we know, yes, it can be asymptomatic. This picture shows the transmission um, and isolate, you know, coronavirus from uh, patients in long-term care facility. And I want to show this three patients. So they were um, all asymptomatic, okay? And they were all PCR positive. And asymptomatic meaning that they never develop any disease, okay? So how many asymptomatic cases are there? We don't know. Another no data zone. Uh, estimates put it all over the place. Uh, currently, originally people were saying, you know, some scientists were suggesting that there's like um, 10 times more infections that we actually detect. Now, I think the estimates put it to quarter infections is not detected or maybe half of infections not detected. So that's about asymptomatic. Now, what I really want to emphasize here is that being positive does not necessarily mean being infectious. So um, without going too deep in the woods of um, how PCR works, JD will take it uh, um, later, patient may, PCR is insanely sensitive test, and if someone is tested positive, it can possibly be that this person does not produce enough infectious virus to transmit it to other people, but the test can still pick up what uh, we call virus leader, fragments of viral genome that are present in the person's nasal cavity or oral cavity, wherever. So, of course, you know, to be on the safe side, we assume that if person is tested positive and this person is um, kind of should be isolated. But in reality, many of the positive tests probably bear very small risk of transmission, especially if person does not experience symptoms. Uh huh. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to address what Steve says. Um, actually, let's let's. So, Steve says that yeah, general evolutionary trends for pathogens to evolve towards less virulence is absolutely right. And in general, we see that pathogens that exist in humans for an extended period of time tend to be mild. Um, of them, the most, the mildest one is herpes, which was with humans before we were humans. Uh, zoonotic infections like Ebola virus, Marburg, uh, all hemorrhagic fevers um, tend to be much more pathogenic because we didn't have a chance to co-evolve. Um, so, clinical manifestations. This is a fantastic image that was produced by a New York-based physician, Dr. Daniel Griffin, which is a chief infectious disease doctor in some big um healthcare provider that spans tri-state area connecticut new jersey and new york so what happens here you have your time of exposure okay and the amount of virus in your samples increases and then you can detect the virus and you can see virus it, it starts to uh, you can easily see it and then Look at this. The peak of virus replication comes right before or on the day of symptoms onset. So when you start feeling crummy, the virus is at peak, and as you get more and more progressively more sick, the amount of virus that you shed actually decreases. Okay? So first phase is considered to be viral symptom phase. That's what People report, um, you know, fever, pain in the joints and muscles and loss of sense of smell. 
headaches, feeling like crap, okay? Then uh, disease goes into the early inflammatory phase. That's when um, respiratory symptoms start to appear. And also some coagulation problems can arise in the patients. At this point, approximately, you can see antibodies in those patients. Now, for a fortunate patients, that um, early inflammatory phase uh, may not progress anywhere further and after short or not so short uh, period of what we call dyspnea, uh, abnormal breathing, they can recover. Uh, less lucky patients uh, may require oxygen, high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation due to the inflammatory processes that occur in the lungs and in the blood vessels that surround lungs. Then in some patients, the secondary infection phase develops. Uh, that's uh, mostly pneumonia, mostly Staphylococcus aureus pneumonia, so most likely hospital-acquired infections. And then uh, in some patients, there's a hyper-inflammatory phase, which now has been described in adults. It's not very frequent. It's multi-system inflammatory um, disease, so basically uh, abnormal inflammation that affects various organs. Now, um, let's say, you know, patient went through viral phase, went through respiratory issues, thanks to anticoagulation therapy, did not have any um, cerebrovascular or just uh, cardiovascular events, such as myocardial infarction or stroke or pulmonary embolism. And now this patient is recovering and goes back home with no virus detected in the system. Um, the, we know now that in many patients, there are effects that last for months after the recovery, it's so-called tail phase. It may be um, mental haziness, can be residual joint and muscle pain, fatigue, respiratory problems. So there are many um, long-term consequences of this infection uh, that should be taken seriously. Risk factors. Uh, I mentioned last time I play with the numbers in um, the state of Ohio. So this update here, you can see in this table, okay? This table, this data are from yesterday. So yesterday night, like 10.30 p.m., I was putting the numbers in. So I want to focus your attention on the percentages. And I was probably too lazy to put it in the form of a graph, but you can see that hospitalization rate uh, drastically increases as we get into like older age. Well, don't look at the total, forget about total. And then CFR is case fatality ratio. So it's number of um, deaths divided by number of cases multiplied by 100. Um, you can see that this number skyrockets in older individuals. So much so that for an average person above the age of 80, chances of dying from COVID-19 in the state of Ohio is 20%, one out of five. And this column, I make it for myself, so it's hospital fatality rate. Just to, you know, uh, sober up people who say, ah, it's nothing serious. So look at this, 75% hospital fatality rate um, for individuals 80 plus which means three out of four people that end up in the hospital who are aged 80 and above will never leave the hospital. That's really sobering, you know? Uh, why I constantly say that it's a state of Ohio? Um, I did some comparisons with the state of Tennessee where my kids are, and it's interesting that in Tennessee, all those numbers are smaller. I have no idea why I don't have, I, I mean, I can look at the data on my other screen, but I don't really know why. Maybe they test test better. 
maybe they have slightly different process of um, writing up the cause of death. Don't know. Other risk factors, um, comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, um, chronic kidney disease. Usually people have multiple factors. People may have diabetes, obesity, hypertension. Three factors increase your uh, chances of um, being hospitalized threefold. Now, minorities, multiple reasons. One is usually um, poverty influences in a very negative way on the survival. So uh, I have personally very serious doubts that um, in people with say African-American or Asian or Alaskan origin, uh, there are some unique genetic uh, predispositions to have more severe coronavirus infection. Usually people of uh, Latino um, community or African-American community or uh, American Indian community, they have less access to healthcare. So that contributes, they have to go to work. Many of them have comorbidities such as diabetes or hypertension that they cannot properly manage due to the lack of access to healthcare. So it's really a, a complicated issue uh, that waits for probably not just scientists, but like medical scientists, but um, sociologists to, to um, unravel. There was an interesting manuscript um, about a couple of months ago, I think, or a month, uh, from uh, the lab of Jean Laurent Casanova at Rockefeller University. Uh, and he kind of showed a correlation in a, a small cohort of really, really sick patients. That those really, really sick patients, many of them have autoimmune response to interferon. Interferon is the key antiviral protein. So since if they have autoimmune response to interferon, the interferon doesn't work as well, and the immune system, you know, kind of sucks. Um, and there are some mutations that also affect the ability to respond to virus infection initially. Um, these mutations may contribute um, to severity of disease in those folks. So this publication was a scientific community uh, looked at it with a lot of interest, but it was somewhat controversial um, just because of interpretation. So the importance of these mutations and these autoimmune responses in the overall uh, mortality and morbidity from COVID-19 is still very unclear. That was the slide that I added, and I really wanted to address this. So that is how deadly the disease is. And the first parameter that I want to describe here is case fatality rate or case fatality ratio, number of confirmed deaths by number of confirmed cases. I mean, of course, it's a percent, but I just forgot to write 100. We can calculate CFR. We have confirmed deaths. We have confirmed cases. Now, infection for the sorry to interrupt we had a question uh from the last slide is what did hfr stand for oh 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 of course of course i just some this one right oh yeah so hfr i call it hospitalization fatality rate i take number of deaths and divided by number of hospitalization it basically shows how many patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19 die. I, since I don't see um, your that chat for some reason, I probably see a panelist chat. I guess you know. I don't know. Oh, ooh, yeah, I can see that now. Awesome. I was I was an idiot. I looked at the wrong chat. That's okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Um, so, infection fatality rate, uh, 
should I didn't didn't correct the C here it should be I okay infection fatality rate is the number of actual deaths divided oh absolutely Barry you're welcome number of actual deaths divided by the number of actual infections and we cannot calculate this number because there are people who died of COVID and were never tested or admitted to a hospital, whatever. There are people who were infected, never got tested, were asymptomatic, thought it was common cold, stuff like that. So we just simply do not have the data. Now, um, if we undercount the infections, we reduce denominator of that um, fraction. If we undercount deaths, we deflate the numerator. How much? We don't know. It's all about we don't know. In general, more tests tend to reveal more infections, which lowers case fatality rate. Now, look at the data in that table. Apologize for the format. I realize how inconvenient it is to read. But I want to focus your attention on these three countries, New Zealand, Iceland, and Singapore. In New Zealand, they extensively tested, and they had case fatality rate of 1.2627. In Iceland, uh, look at the number of tests per 1 million people. Well, I mean, I, we know that Iceland is like 300,000 people, but they were testing the living daylights of the population, they got CFR of 0.36. And if you look at Singapore, it is absolutely astounding. According to Singapore officials, they have case fatality ratio of 0.05%. So that's ridiculously low. Singapore has one of the best um, epidemiolo epidemiological services in the world. They have the epidemiology services like US CDC actually has a hospital component. So people that were diagnosed, they were able to actually isolate them in the hospital, which significantly reduced the transmission and they managed the infection probably better. So. If we, and there, there, were, there were some publications from, I think from Cambridge, um, suggesting that we can kind of safely assume that um, infection fatality rate, again, it's assumptions, back of an envelope calculations. Infection fatality rate of this coronavirus is half percent. So then if we take um, the number of deaths in Ohio and presume that it's 0.5% of overall number of cases, we get that quote unquote actual number of cases in Ohio have been slightly more than a million. Considering that Ohio population is slightly above 11 million, it's like 10% of Ohio population. After almost, well, nine months, okay? So herd immunity, we need 70% of people having you know, being exposed to the virus or vaccine. We are away from that herd immunity. Uh, achieving it by just exposing people, yeah, not gonna work. Now, I got some data here for um, different states. You can see that CFR is kinda um, different. Michigan and Pennsylvania beat us in CFR I would say that, you know, that's the race I would happily lose. Um, I mentioned that Tennessee has a pretty, as lower case fatality ratio. Maybe it is because they test more. That's the number of tests per million. Um, so there are so many factors that you can't really um, say, oh, that's the only the number of tests. Uh, per million that uh, produce CFR. I, I give you the distribution of this this data here when, when you know, on x-axis you have tests per million people and on y-axis you have CFR. It's all over the place. I try to add some trend lines, but 
just no, just no. Correlation is really, really weak. Okay. Now I couldn't resist to include Russia in the list here, and you can see that CFR in Russia is um, slightly lower than in the U.S. Well, I am in contact with you know my friends back there, and it's the reporting is bad. Um, doctors are encouraged not to diagnose COVID, not to prescribe tests. Um, you know, uh, deaths uh, are written being from COVID only if it's a direct death from COVID, not like COVID precipitated some other um, complications like thromboembolic events or something. And targeting the virus. So, uh, we can target the entrance by monoclonal antibodies. That's the infamous, or famous, I should say, famous Regeneron that the president received. Now, mind you, Regeneron is not antibody. Regeneron is the company. Antibody, antibody cocktail has some weird acronym-like name, I don't know. Uh, we can target viral replication by remdesivir, another drug that uh, he received. Now, with remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies, it's a catch-22. They have to be given very, very early in infection. And that's what happened to um, to President. He was given the drugs um, very early in infection when he just tested positive. And that's how they should be administered. And no wonder that if you would look at the Okay. Um, thanks, Bill. So, if you look at, um, you know, an average folk, you get tested positive, so what? You go back home and you wait. Now, the president was given uh, antibodies and remdesivir very early, and that likely significantly reduced the um, negative effects that virus had on his health. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, remdesivir is in kind of a shortage in the United States, and it's intravenously administered. Monoclonal antibodies cause an arm and a leg, and also they cannot be produced in a large amount. Um, citation for the, uh, so Daniel asks if we can get citation for the graphic, this one, the illustration. I will, <laughs> I will see. Okay, I don't remember where I found this, but I will, I will check. Okay, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm gonna when I'm when I'm gonna switch to JD, I'm gonna do a haphazard search. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Dan. Um, now, can we? So this, these two things here, remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies, are essentially the only two things that we can use to target the virus. We can target the disease. We now know that we can use steroids to reduce inflammation. Um, steroids in the combination with the inhibitor of pro-inflammatory cytokine called interleukin-6, um, the drug called tocilizumab. Steroids and tocilizumab together seem to be better than tocilizumab or steroids alone. And um, doctors use anticoagulants, such as low molecular weight heparin, to reduce clotting because we do have hypercoagulative stage of this disease. Uh, the problem is it's virtually impossible to do a proper um, double-blinded, um, randomized, um, placebo-controlled study because of ethical concerns. If anticoagulants, you know, w we think they work, we probably should just throw them in the pot, which makes this whole treatment uh, somewhat of a kitchen sink approach. But it's, again, um, from clinical study standpoint, it's really a complicated situation now. Vaccines. 
Um, those are the ones in the phase three clinical trial. Nothing has changed since then. Um, vaccines are safe and immunogenic. Uh, as far as I know, mm -mm -mm. so Janssen, Moderna, um, AstraZeneca, uh, Pfizer, they all are in very deep in the phase three. They almost or already finished recruiting patients for phase three. Um, first data are expected to appear like soon, November, December, hopefully. You may have heard about halting the vaccine trials. If there is a serious adverse effect, companies stop the trial and look at, stop recruiting, look at them, what this event was precipitated by. Um, so far, it doesn't seem to be a direct consequence of a vaccine use. So you may have heard about um, the Russian vaccine, which uh, with fanfares was um, licensed. Uh, it was given uh, regulatory approval in terms of um, like you don't have to file all that paperwork later, but it is not approved for manufacturing. It is still in phase three. Um, it's kind of a weird legal situation in Russia. You can get a vaccine, but there is no official mass vaccination campaign. You can sign up and go and get vaccinated. You don't have to be recruited. Nobody contacts you. You contact them. Um, Sinovac, as far as I know, this one is about to start administering vaccines in China. That is sort of word of mouth data. So I quite frankly don't have uh, official announcement or something to back it up. Uh, it was, I personally, I can tell you, uh, heard it in the letter written by a Chinese um, citizen, just kind of being concerned about uh, rigor of testing the vaccines. Uh, the Probably the disappointing part about vaccines, well, coronaviruses in general, is that most likely the vaccines are going to protect us from disease, but not from the infection. So even if you're vaccinated, you can get infected, virus can reproduce in you, and you <clears throat> possibly can spread it to other people. Um, whether or not it is so, we still we don't know. Hopefully, it's going to be better than that, but even if it's if it protects us from the disease, it's great news. You know, people don't get in the hospital. That's fantastic, you know. Um, yeah, this fecal spectacle. Well, I said this before. I'm seeing this now. Um, money that are spent on health sciences in the U.S., it's laughable. Um, just a fraction of military budget, which... My, which is mind-boggling, uh, could have been spent on the development of drugs, vaccine development, epidemiological studies. Um, and yeah, there is sort of, there, there is a methodology how to do it. So it's not like just trial and error. People actually just routinely do this. And time intellectualism in the White House, executive branch, um, situation turned up to be FUBAR. Um, no leadership at the federal level, um, and to a large extent, well, certain locations. We we're lucky to have a governor that listens to science. Not every state is as lucky. Um, national stockpile of PP, that is, I'm sorry, that's un unacceptable. Uh, it was not replenished uh, over the years. And um, the fact that healthcare system is commercialized. So I gave this data before and I'm telling them now that's the number of hospital beds per 10,000 people. And I don't think this number's changed dramatically since 2016. So Japan and South Korea, which managed to mitigate the infection very well, had, you know, much more hospital beds. Uh, Germany, of all European countries, is the highest if you're not counting Russia, but it's a separate story with Russia. So 
um, it kind of shows you that it's a wake up call for the US healthcare system and for um, federal epidemiology preparedness. So I would happily answer or not answer any, any questions that you may have. I'm just looking at the chat on the different screen. So go for it. I don't know if. Um... Hey, Mike, I'll just add uh -huh. a little detail about the money that this. This budget you're showing here, I suspect, is the entire NIH budget. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay, right. so in reality, the proportion going to infectious disease is probably a tiny fraction of it. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but much less, much less. Yes. Um, and you, you look at the money, a vast majority of it, in fact, would be going to things like cancer or um, those sort of diseases rather than infectious disease. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So it's even less than that. Yeah, it just for a comparison. Now, here I have a wonderful question. Is there any real data on reinfections yet? Yes. Um, not a lot. So far, there have been, to my knowledge, <clears throat> four um, confirmed cases of reinfection with coronavirus. And by confirmed, I mean that um, scientists managed to co completely sequence, identify the entire genome uh, of the virus that infected a person first, like in the spring, and then second time, like in the August. And those two viruses were confirmed to be different, slightly different genetically. So like second virus carried a couple mutations, which is totally normal for viruses. Doesn't mean that it's a different virus. So two distinct isolates of coronavirus. In three cases, I believe, of reinfection, um, Second infection was, uh, it's okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll address, uh, okay, I can see Connie, I will address this question as well. And da Daniel, thanks for um, the update, yes. So, to reinfections, out of those four confirmed cases, three were okay, like no real symptoms second time, and one person, was sicker second time. But again, it's four cases, so not really a lot to work with. I hope I addressed David's question. If not, uh, I'd be happy to elaborate on that. Um, yeah, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases was reduced by 789 million. That's a disgrace, I'm sorry. Uh, why are there so many false positive test results? Okay. Um, uh, David, I'm going to second. I'm going to answer Connie's question first. So, Connie, thank you for the question. A great question as well. So, um, when 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 someone tests positive, um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna intrude on JDeep's um, ground. JDeep, I'm sorry about that. So, when somebody is tested positive, it means that um, the analysis, the PCR gives you basically a number, it's called CT number, number of cycles, and the, the more virus, the more, the more nucleic acid you have, the more virus you have, the lower the number. So, um, as far as I know, according to CDC guidelines, anything below 35 is considered to be positive. But let's say if you are at if number that <clears throat> lab receives is 12, you are shedding virus like crazy. And if number that lab produces is 34.5, you probably don't really have a virus and you should do what's called confirmatory testing. So the false positive results come from detecting such minute amount of virus that it's basically an artifact of testing. Uh, the amount of virus that those people have in their noses, some residue, 
maybe they were asymptomatic or they are about to get sick, but it's going to happen like two, three weeks. So I hope that addresses, I think JDeep can elaborate on uh, the spectrum of results better. So it's basically not like plus minus black and white. Uh, it's like, okay, red and white. It's not red. It can be pink, purple, dark red, all those shades, and it's all considered to be positive. Uh, Connie, I don't know if I answered your question. I'm sorry if it was like not good. Uh, do the coronaviruses act the same as influenza? I'm, this year vaccine is for last year major strains. Well, okay, coronaviruses do not mutate like influenza. They're very genetically stable. So as far as we know, the vaccine, like we we have one strain, that's it. The, the differences that we see in different isolates, they are not consequential in terms of the virus behavior, in terms of the disease that it causes, in terms of the immune response to it. So um, the vaccine should just cover everything, okay? They are unusually genetically stable. I hope I, I addressed um, David Champa's question. Um, uh, Mike, I had a question asked here uh, uh, about the uh, your idea that 25 to 50% of the cases go undetected. Uh, uh -huh. They wanted to know how you determined that, and does it mean for every active case there's uh, tw uh, 25 to 50% more cases that are undetected than ac uh, active cases, or is it for total cases uh, that amount went undetected? It seems way too low. So, so thank you for the question, whoever asked it. Um, we can't really know for sure how many cases are asymptomatic and undetected because it's a dark matter. The estimates put it, um, so let's say in some studies they show that, for instance, for each 20 detected, uh, test, uh, blah, 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 detected cases, there are five that are completely asymptomatic and they fly under the radar. They are never detected um, by PCR. In other studies, they say that for each 20 detected cases, again, quote unquote, 20 detected cases, there are 20 cases that fly under the radar. Um, but again, those studies inevitably look at the certain cohort of patients, certain cohort of predicted cohort. The bigger it is, the better, but it varies even between the countries or inside the country between the regions. So there are some studies, I think, from Spain, from Italy, uh, that put this number, you know, a different, uh, uh, in different sort of range, but overall we're not talking about orders of magnitude, maybe 25 to 50% of all cases they never detected because we don't test everyone. I hope I addressed that question. I don't see. Okay, David, Coney, okay. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thanks, I appreciate, I appreciate your thanks. Um, anything else or I can, Switch to JD. I think that's it for questions. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm working, I'm teaching at the biotech as well as the bioscience department here. And also, you know, I'm working at a company which is in Mentor. I'm working there only for a few months. So I was working there on the detection of the virus by RT-PCR. And now I'm not working like that, but now I'm working uh, on the um, uh, antibody stuff. So after this excellent presentation by Mike, I'll be going back to the extremely basic biology of school level. So how we detect the virus? We detect the virus by RT-PCR. So this RT-PCR, which is the gold standard, 
you see that everywhere in the whole world they are uh, saying that well we are using the rt pcr rt pcr to do this detection so how we do this rt pcr i'll be explaining a little bit here uh see currently i was just checking today this morning that over the world 49 million people got infected death is about 1.2 million and in this us alone about 9.94 million are infected 241000 people died and see just yesterday just yesterday's data about more than 100000 people got infected so how they are looking for this infection so basically they are doing by rt pcr so as i told you earlier i'll go back to the extremely basic level biology first so after this high tech presentation i'll be just re refreshing our memory one second here so let us go here that all of us know the central dogma of life what is this one we know that dna makes rna rna makes protein so this step from DNA to RNA is called transcription and RNA to protein, this step is called translation. So now what Steve was, uh, what Mike was saying that there are uh, in our cell, we have DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, fats, carbohydrates, all of this stuff we have in our body. And we have thousands of proteins in our body and a lot of those proteins are the enzymes. Now, all of the living cells, we have DNA and RNA. But uh, what Mike was saying, the virus is very unique. They will not have both DNA and RNA, but they will have either DNA, that means the DNA virus, such as uh, the adenovirus, which causes the common cold, herpes, HIV, uh, HPV, etc. Whereas some viruses, they have RNA genome, such as the HIV, uh, which causes the AIDS, flu, and our good old friend COVID. So see here, what I'm showing here, the our COVID genome is RNA. So now there are different ways how we can measure the DNA and RNA. See, this is that RNA virus, so we should be measuring the RNA of the virus. But you know, uh, handling DNA is easier Measuring DNA is easier, but measuring RNA is not that simple. There are ways. There are ways to measure RNA, but which is extremely expensive, and you cannot do it very fast and in the laboratory like that. So people are looking at how to measure that RNA. Actually, if you go back to the old days, in, in 1975, there was one scientist here. He's still alive, actually. His name is David Baltimore. What he did, see in the mice, you have a lot of mouse here and uh, here and there in your neighborhood. So in the mouse, he found there are some virus which is having some enzyme, which is having some enzyme. This one can do the opposite thing of central dogma. See here, we know that DNA makes RNA. He found out that those mouse RNA virus, they have some enzymes that can make RNA back to DNA. See that green dot dot line on the left side? So then he named them as reverse transcription. And the enzyme which makes RNA back to DNA is called reverse transcriptase. And obviously he won the Nobel Prize in 75, long time ago. But this a reverse transcriptase is a very is a gold standard. So this reverse transcriptase we use to make this RNA. See this one here, that our DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein. This see this one RNA can be converted back to DNA by this enzyme reverse transcription. So this one is the RT part of the test RT PCR. So now we know. The RNA of the COVID can be converted to DNA by reverse transcription. So this is the RT-PCR. This is the RT part of RT-PCR. Now, what is PCR? This is one interesting story of PCR. What happens, you know, I mean, this is a long time ago, in 1985 or so, 83 or so. What happens, there was one guy, he died a few years back. His name was Dr. Kerry Mullins. 
So he was working, he was working on different uh, DNA and RNA and other stuff. So he found not going to the story, but the interesting story is that once uh, he was driving in the busy highway of West Coast, and then all of a sudden he got some idea. He just parked the car in next of the busy highway and then got that idea. Then he started working on this one. So what he and other scientists, they did that, you know, that uh, maybe most of you have been to Yellowstone National Park, where you see all the hot geysers, all the hot water coming out, boiling water there. So he found some bacteria in those hot geysers and found out that this bacteria is having some enzyme. That enzyme really changed the world of biotechnology. So here, see, this is a picture actually from where the that bacteria was found. In fact, uh, one of my friends went to went to Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. I asked him to take a picture, and I uh, use this picture in my class, in my biotech and biology class. So what they did, what Kerry Mullis did, from here he found one bacteria that is having one enzyme. So that enzyme is called TAC polymerase. So that enzyme, why I'm saying that this enzyme changed the world of biotechnology, because you know, this enzyme and by a specific method, you can amplify extremely tiny amount of DNA to extremely high amount. Such as say for instance, say, uh, say there's a murder. Okay, suppose there's a murder or there may be say a rape or there may be you are getting a hair follicle or you may be getting a tiny amount of DNA, something like that. So that DNA can be amplified amplified a lot so how much a lot suppose you have say one copy of dna found from this virus or somewhere else you can make one copy to two copies by one round of amplification then again you can do two copies to four copies by a second round four to eight eight to 16 30 64 120 like this so generally we do about 40 rounds of amplification so Using from one copy to four, after 40 rounds, you can get billions of copies. Actually, you know, I mean, a lot of you are seeing this uh, uh, series, say, uh, crime series investigation, where they're getting a small murder victim, a lot small sort of uh, hair follicle or this and that. From here, the DNA can be amplified a lot. So this is called the polymerase chain reaction. This is the invention of the century. Okay, this one really changed the world. You cannot even imagine how much this polymerase chain reaction changed the world. So now, as I told you earlier, this uh, genome of this COVID is RNA. So RNA can be converted to DNA by the method of reverse transcription. But you know that RNA which are getting, the DNA which are getting from the RNA to DNA thing from the uh, nasopharyngeal swab or so, extremely tiny amount to detect so you have to amplify this one so this is this amplification is done by this polymerase chain reaction so now you are combining these two methods rt pcr so rt is the one which is the reverse transcription the genome of rna from that uh, from the covid is being fast converted to reverse uh, to dna and that extremely tiny amount of DNA, after doing 40 cycles, 40 rounds of amplification, you can detect by this polymerase chain reaction. So this is the nutshell of RT-PCR, what we do. Now, you know uh, what uh, Mike was saying, the CT value and other stuff. So, you know, when you're getting, say, the nasopharyngeal swab from a patient, so that patient may have extremely high copy virus, or very low copy virus or middle copy virus. So how to say like that? In fact, there is a machine. I'm not going into detail in this short period of time and make your life miserable on this Friday afternoon when all of you are waiting for the data, for the result of the vote. So I would say here, there's a machine. When this amplification is going on, I repeat, when the amplification is going on, making the copies, the machine can detect the 
product of amplification made, which is shown here. See here, this is a complicated picture though. But see, suppose if you come to the right side of this S-shaped sigmoid graph, C1. One means if you are starting with, say, one copy of virus, you will get very low amplification. When you are coming towards the left side, see these high copies, the green thing towards the left side. So more and more virus copy, more and more virus copy uh, the starting material, more and more this graph should be moving towards the left. See the last one here, which is 10 to the power 9. That means the starting material is 1 billion copies. See, like this way, the machine will detect this one copy, the lowest one, to this is one representation up to 10, up to 1 billion. So now what Mike was saying, the CT value. So what is the CT value? What you know that machine in, will do, instead, they will make this graph. The machine will generate this graph like this way. And see, this is a cycle number. See from one, cycle number one to cycle number 40, which is written in the lower number here, cycle number one to 40. So now what machine will do, they, the machine will arbitrarily draw a line across all of these graphs here, which is shown here. See, they will draw a line here. So this line is called the threshold. So now, now the machine will automatically determine the cycle threshold, which is a CT value. Now, if you compare with this one, see if you draw a line here, see the lower number of the virus will have higher CT value. The higher number of virus will have the lower CT value, which is here. See here, this is a CT. If it is higher number of virus, you will have low CT value. See here, if it is say, these are 32, 33 CT value, the virus number is very low. If it is having say 15, 16 CT value, the virus number is very high. So this is one of our data from our lab, from different patients. See here, the CT value of this patient here, I wrote here high copy. The CT value was about four, about how much is about 16, 17, like that. Whereas this is the low copy, which is about 34, 35. See what Mike was saying before that low copy, very low copy here. But you know, this guy who was here with high CT value, this guy was really sick. Actually, he was really suffering for eight, nine days. And he was having 104, 105 fever for a long time with a lot of these uh, breathing problems. I know that. Okay, but anyway, so like this way, we are doing the uh, detection of this virus by RT-PCR, and we record uh, down the CT value. And I told you that lower the CT value of RT-PCR, the higher the copy number. Okay, so I, like this way, the other guys in the lab are now detecting that uh, the a copy number of that virus. And what people are doing, they are taking the nasopharyngeal swab, those uh, those uh, earbud like this thing. They will put that earbud like this thing in the nose, take out the swab and send it to us, mail it to us in some, uh, in some files. And then we extract that RNA from there. And sometimes we even do not extract that RNA, we straight do the uh, there's some special way to do this RT-PCR. Okay, so this is looking for the genome. So now, let me just talk a little bit. I'll have one or two things to talk about here. Uh, this is the uh, nucleic acid detection. So now, there are uh, different ways how you can detect that antigen or antibody. So uh, how to detect that antigen and antibody? What is antigen? What is antibody? Okay. Can can anybody hear me? I can see Mike is talking. Can I'll anybody? Hear? Oh, I can hear okay. you. Okay. Okay. Good. Not... Okay. Yeah. So I'll take only two or three more minutes. Okay. So just what is antigen? What is antibody? See, antigen is the one which the virus is bringing or any sort of foreign body coming to our body, and antibody is the one 
which is a protein present in our body to fight the foreign infection. So now people are detecting that antigen of the virus and people are also detecting the antibody level of the virus after the infection has been done. So here, this slide, similar slide which Mike showed, our, showed earlier, see, I'm not going and making your life miserable, just this coronavirus coming into a body and then they will, uh, they will come out from the cells, uh, thousands of virus particles will be coming out. So now different companies are working on the detection of this viral protein thing. So this is the virus and all of these proteins are sticking out. So now this company Abbott, uh, most of you know this company Abbott, they are having this kit out in the market, which is for the antigen test. See, they will be looking for this amount of this protein of the virus present in the in the saliva and the other swab of your of the mouth thing. Okay, so this this is the Bionex now. In fact, uh, while I was working at the Cleveland Clinic, I had an opportunity to work with about this detection, the RT-PCR detection with them for, for six years, I was working at the collaborative work with them. So I know that how they're working there, which is a really interesting way. So anyway, so what they're doing there now, this is a rapid test kit. All of you know this one now. See, this is a fast, reliable, affordable, and portable rapid test kit. And they are now delivering millions of these kits to different places. So this one should be $5 a piece, which is very cheap. Five, 15 minutes, very, uh, very easy to use test, test uh, in a point of care. And this is from the website. From the website, they are saying they, will, they are working like a secure digital boarding pass that can be scanned uh, to enter organization and other places where people can gather. This one can be uh, be very uh, having a high speed, simplicity, affordable access and reliability. Actually, there is a there is a uh, apps which you have to download in your phone. And after getting the kit here, after getting the testing thing there, see this barcode here. You have to scan this barcode in your phone. And that one should be entered in your phone. And when you are uh, boarding the plane or so, you, the, they will scan this barcode. So this is the one which are, which they're detecting. Other companies are there, which they're using to detect the antigen of the virus. Now, in our company, we are working to detect the antibody also. There are other companies there out there, but we are working uh, in our company like that. So this is the kit from our company. What we do here, we just prick a finger with that uh, needle thing there. Then we just put a drop of blood here. We put a drop of blood here. Then we put a, cup, a drop of other solution. Then we wait them to diffuse through this window. See, this is just like the pregnancy detection key. You take that uh, urine sample of a suspected pregnant woman and put that urine there. It is exactly the same thing there. So when you put in here, in about five to 10 minutes, you can see the presence of antibody. There are two differences of antibodies which you can detect. One is IgM, which goes high in about seven days after infection, then it eventually diminishes. But IgG is the one which stays there for a long time. We do not know how long the IgG stays there because see, this virus only came out Early, early January. So this is one of our data. See, if it is negative, no band should be there. If it is positive for IgG and IgM, IgM is very weak in this picture. And if it is after, say, two weeks or so, this data actually after close to three weeks, you can see the IgM, uh, the IgG band here. So like this way, we are working on the RT-PCR, we are working on the antibody detection, but this is this kit is being under the validation stage now. I'm, so I'm not going into in depth of this kit at all there. So this is the one how people are detecting that virus. They're detecting either by RT-PCR, which is the golden standard. They are now doing that antigen test, as well as also that antibody test, which is uh, 
out there, but the antibody test will be after the infection is there, and we do not know how long this antibody will be present there. Okay, so I should be leave, uh, stopping here because Steve needs to cover. So, folks, I know it's a beautiful day out. I'm itching to get out there too. Still got some leaves to rake, of course. I'm sure many of you do. So I'll try to keep this brief. Um, I'm not a virologist um, or a clinician of any kind. I am an ecologist. And so I come at this from a different angle than my previous two colleagues. I've been teaching a lesson on infectious disease uh, in my environmental science class for better part of a decade. In fact, I gave a, a knowledge exchange ooh, probably more than a dozen years ago uh, on this topic, kind of cautionary tale of where we were heading and in essence predicting that someday we would experience something like this. I personally thought it would be influenza, um, not the SARS coronavirus group, but uh, I can't be perfect, right? <laughs> Um, but what I'm trying to show you here is that this is something we have seen coming. Um, these are just a variety of co quotes I've pulled from uh, some key journals. You can see that we understand that the key problem here is it's not a health issue much more as it is an ecological problem. Our behavior and how we treat the environment leads to the risk of these spreads. In fact, um, in 2007, you can see here we were speaking very specifically about the SARS-CoV uh, virus line and these horseshoe bats, um, better part of a decade in advance of the bomb exploding, quite frankly. And really what it comes down to is that how we treat the environment, um, particularly uh, in, in the case of uh, biodiversity and biodiversity decline, uh, elevates the risk of more of these sort of pandemics coming down the road. So um, as my colleagues have pointed out before, you know, get used to these masks and get used to the reality that we may see this happen again with a different uh, virus. And one of the main reasons why, as Mike pointed out earlier, is that we're dealing with pathogens that can jump from one species to another with these so-called zoonotic diseases. This is where, of course, the ecology comes in. In fact, more than two thirds of the most recent outbreaks were all zoonotic disease. And we're talking about some of the most uh, dangerous, including things like HIV, uh, as well as influenza. Uh, as a more broad term here, we can think about these viruses uh, having what we call reservoir hosts. Uh, and a classic one is, of course, the mosquito. The mosquito is actually technically also a vector because it transmits the, the pathogens from person to person. Um, but also it can be treated as a reservoir because it can contain a variety of, uh, uh, its population can contain a population of a variety of zoonotic uh, pathogens. Let me show you the phylogeny of the coronavirus to help highlight this point. So look over here to the right. This is effectively the family tree of the coronaviruses. If you think about these branches, this represents a common ancestry node right here, and then you've got the descendants to the right. Um, at the very top here in red, we have the SARS-CoV group that Mike was referring to earlier. If you look carefully here, these images are highlighting viruses found in particular hosts. Here we have the pangolin, um, and right here we have those horseshoe bats, and then the humans are, are above that. If you want to see a more resolved image of this down in the lower left, this image here in the magenta summarizes what you're seeing up here in, in the very top right. In other words, the best evidence right now is that the genetic, especially when we look at the complete genome of the SARS-CoV viruses, the, the complete genome links most closely to these horseshoe bat viruses that we find in southern China. You probably heard some talk about the role of pangolins, especially in the summertime. And the reason for that is that when we look at certain uh, genes in the coronavirus that match up more closely, particularly the ones that deal with the receptors for that ACE2 uh, receptor on, the, on our surface that, we, that they gain entry into, match more closely to the pangolin. So this is what led people to think, oh, maybe it was a pangolin to human um, jump. That's not the consensus right now. 
Uh, the pangolins are probably what we'd consider a, a sister taxon. Um, and it just so happens that those genes that the pangolin shares with the covey two that we find in humans um, simply were preserved and from, from an ancestor probably somewhere at this point right here. The other thing to point out that I want to point out here is notice this pattern, right? We have the original SARS outbreak from the early 2000s here. Uh, there's the civet uh, and bats once again showing up on the scene. Here we have camels and bats. This was the, the Middle Eastern uh, case of, of coronavirus. Cows down here, and these some of these are some of the more common cold varieties of coronavirus. But once again, we see them jumping bats, mice, camels. Uh, this is the classic illustration of a zoonotic type disease. Here's the problem. So this graph shows you the trend lines. We are seeing a pretty steady increase in the numbers of these zoonotic disease outbreaks over time, over the last three or four decades. According to the World Health Organization, uh, zoonotic spillovers, that is, these jumps from these reservoirs into humans has tripled uh, in the last decade alone. So this is a pretty alarming trend. Uh, the real question now becomes, well, why? Well, I could spend hours talking about why there is a collection of, of, of ecological drivers, if you want to call that are, that are pushing this, this trend line. Many things are involved. I can give you a couple examples. One is to think about predators. It turns out, this is not always the case, but it turns out that many of the reservoir populations um, are more in line with the prey category in the ec ecological food chain and the predators that typically would control those populations suffer more easily to how humans modify the landscape. Um, think of bobcats, think of some of our, even our, our dragonflies, believe it or not, which would control something like a mosquito. When you go and you look at, for example, the Ohio endangered species list, you can actually find several um, dragonflies on that list, but you're not going to find any mosquitoes on that list, obviously. Um, and why is that a problem? Well, they control those pests. They control the mice that might be carrying Lyme disease, for example. In fact, I have an example in my next slide here of this. Lyme disease is on the rise. Well, why is it on the rise? Well, one major reason is there's a decline in the predators that control the populations of small rodents that carry the tick. The tick in turn carries the, the Lyme disease, which is a um, spirochete bacterium in this particular case. So it's a sort of a, a cascade um, of problems where as we modify the landscape, the predators suffer the greatest consequences. Uh, that favors now these vectors and reservoir populations to build in numbers and therefore increase the transmissibility of Lyme. And interestingly enough, uh, speaking of Lyme disease, there's been a spike in cases of Lyme disease. And I believe, I suspect what will, will pan out is, is that, talk about this particular year, is because so many people decided to get outdoors this summer because of the whole social distancing problem. And many people perhaps a little inexperienced uh, with how to protect themselves from Lyme. Uh, so that's just another interesting side story. Agriculture is another good example of how we can elevate the risk of infectious disease. You've heard of certainly avian flu and swine flu. Uh, they emerge because we do this. We pack animals in tight quarters, just like when we pack kids into schools and that increases the risk of infection. Uh, so does this sort of practice with other animals. But it's not just the only way. We can also be thinking about, for example, the fertilizers, the animal waste that, that wash away into the watersheds, pollute our bodies of water, think like Lake Erie, of course, um, and that growth, that algae growth can, can uh, encourage the growth of other kinds of reservoir populations. Snails, for example, are a, a well-known reservoir of a number of, of infectious diseases. So this is just another example of how human activity is connected to this problem of, of emergent disease. The one that concerns me the most is the problem we're facing with biodiversity. If you haven't heard, so in 2019, um, the United Nations published a pretty sweeping report and it was 
quite devastating news. In effect, they had reported that since um, roughly the 1960s, we have seen approximately a 50%, repeat, a 50% decline in the overall abundance of life on this planet. To understand how shocking that is, imagine walking to a doctor's office uh, and the doctor says, well, you know, half of all your cells are dead. You know, how will you react to that, right? Um, and the shocking thing about that particular report was it got no reaction. You know, it was released and um, I never saw it on the front page of any media feed. Um, so this is a little concerning. Why? Because, well, biodiversity is kind of our best buffer. Uh, it, it produces what we call this dilution effect, where if you look at the lower image here, when you have very little diversity, we can think of this in terms of species, we can think of this perhaps even better as a genetic diversity, then the chances of being close to someone else that will share that similarity and therefore transmit the pathogen more easily is much higher. So it favors transmission to have a relatively low diversity. There is a, an amplification level here. This is really at low, low diversity. This is really because you have fewer hosts. So the pathogen needs hosts. And so it becomes more likely to be abundant when you increase diversity a little bit. But then beyond that point, adding diversity can really dramatically reduce the risk of infection. And it's because now you are surrounded by different species or different individuals and the likelihood of encountering another individual that could transmit like this star on the far right is much lower. So biodiversity really, in my mind, is one of the more important and overlooked uh, risk factors associated with increased uh, pathogens. So maybe as a quick summary, I, I, I want to convey this point. This is just a couple of examples of how we interact with our environment all along the margins of this graphic. So human interactions, our behaviors, think our usage of masks, for example, and our unwillingness, our willingness to do so, our mobility, our ability to transport viruses rapidly across the, the, uh, the, the globe. But then, of course, how we treat our animals in enclosed habitats increases the risk of even how we interact and manage wildlife in terms of hunting. We can think about biodiversity loss, predator-prey dynamics over here, even things like invasive species. For example, in Ohio, we have a mosquito that is invasive. Um, Asiatic tiger mosquito, I believe, is the name of it, and it carries with it a number of uh, pathogens that would normally not exist in Ohio. So this has got people, of course, nervous as well. And then we can also think about some classic topics like environmental change, climate change, um, no surprise, more pathogens exist in warmer climates than in colder climates. Cold and frost is a good defense. As we see changes there, we can expect elevated risks. Um, so you get the idea. There is an, dozens and dozens of things that humans are doing in the wrong direction to amplify this, this, this problem. Um, and what are we going to do about it? Well, just sort of closing point here. We are aware of it obviously. And I'll just point out one particular example of the efforts to fight back. And it's known as what's called the One Health Initiative. Uh, think of it as an umbrella. We are now recognizing that human health is not unrelated to the health of the environment, un not unrelated to the health of the animals that we depend on. Uh, and that's the idea of this, this One Health. If we focus on better husbandry, better uh, environmental health, conservation, those sort of topics, it's a win-win-win, right? We, we are going to ultimately save ourselves in health. And if you want to get some sort of appreciation of this, right, um, I think I read somewhere that the total cost, economic cost, that we're going to uh, absorb from just this one virus is on the order of like five to, to ten tr um, trillion dollars, okay? So why am I mentioning that? Well, because oftentimes you hear people say, well, it's too expensive to conserve habitat, too expensive to be worrying about biodiversity. We've got to be worried about economic growth. Uh, but they're, they're, they're intertwined here. And so we need to begin to, to embrace that reality. And I think we'll find it's, it's a, a cost-saving endeavor to think about how to protect the environment because it ultimately protects us as well. Um, I haven't been looking to see if there's any questions. Um, but if anyone has any questions, this would be a great time to address them to myself or to 
um, Mike or JD. I have uh, really nothing else to add. There's sort of like a nice closing point. Right. Still seeing JD screen. Hopefully you guys are all seeing my notes. Is that the case? Yeah, we saw yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, that was good. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm always a little paranoid about what what you see and what no. I see. No, 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 okay. we can't see. So anyway, any questions? Just looking at the chat yeah. here. Okay. I don't know. I didn't. I don't know. And we lost of all our all our attendees. I don't even know what. No, no, no. Right we now. have attendees. <laughs> we have attendees here. Okay. Uh, no yeah, they are. Okay, okay, I see that. I hope everyone enjoyed it and found it informative. Um, of course, we're always reachable by email. I think most people can track down our emails if anyone has a question. I saw that Jennifer uh, sent us an email before the presentation. I've already commented on to her, and, and I'm sure others will too. So don't ho hesitate. And hopefully this was recorded so we can share with the larger audience that was unable to attend today. This was recorded. Uh, I don't Listen, see Phil. any extra questions, but we do have a lot of applause in the feedback section. Right. Oh, there is a feedback section. <laughs> that <is>. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody.